the Winter Park History Museum presents A Stroll Down Park Avenue, the podcast. Hello, and thank you for tuning in. My name is Betsy Rogers Owens, and I am honored to be a board member of the Winter Park History Museum. And it's my pleasure this morning to be hosting this podcast on the saving of Casa Feliz. Casa Feliz, which means happy house in Spanish, is said to be the signature residential work of my grandfather, the architect James Gamble Rogers II. And we have three very distinguished panelists joining us today, two of whom happen to be my parents. Talk about a stacked deck. Winter Park native Jack Rogers has worn a lot of hats in our community over the years. Like his father, he's an architect and enjoyed a distinguished career in his own right. But for this morning's purposes, he and my mother led the years-long campaign to save and restore Casa Feliz. My mother, Peggy Rogers, whom you may affectionately hear me refer to as Pegster, was my father's co-strategist and excuse me, community organizer in the early days of Saving Casa, and since that time has served as a board member, interior decorator, and overall hype girl for this amazing Andalusian farmhouse. Finally, Frank Rourke is another Winter Park native who has been instrumental over the years in the ongoing success of Casa Feliz. He's the general contractor who volunteered his services to restore Casa Feliz, and in the years since has headed up restorations of many other historic structures, including the Capen House. So Frank, this morning my first question goes to you. How does it feel to absolutely be drowning in Rogers's? <laughs> well, I would say it's a, it's a step up <laughs> for me. <laughs> It's, it's always, it's been an honor and a privilege to be able to work with the Rogers family on this adventure we call Casa Feliz, so, well, so happy to be here. Thanks. Before we dive into the Casa Feliz rescue story, I'd like to set the stage a little bit, and we'll start with my dad. When was Casa Feliz built, and why is it called the signature residential design of James Gamble Rogers II? Well, it was, it was built in 1933, and uh, interestingly enough, uh, at an interview one time with Hugh McCain, Hugh McCain asked my dad, you know, what is your signature residence in Winter Park? And, and he said, Casa Feliz. Um, you know, speaking as an architect, I think the reason that it's his signature facility is that he was given a completely free hand in the design of the building. You know, Mr. Barber told him that he wanted so many rooms and he gave him the budget, which was only about $25,000, if you can imagine that, for a 6,000 square foot house. But he, Mr. Barber said, you know, go ahead and do it any way you want. Uh, if I don't like it, uh, when it's finished, I'll sell it. Um, I think also it came at a time in his career that, um, of course, it was in the, in the Depression. And um, the story that my dad always told me was that was the, the, my favorite time in, in the practice of architecture because we only had one job at a time and uh, we had time to get it just right, just the way we wanted it. So that, that is a uh, very rare opportunity for an architect. Um, he was only about 30 years old, and uh, it's really remarkable that he was able to produce a building with the quality of detail that uh, Casa Feliz exhibits. Frank, there's a story about when you all were restoring the house that I think speaks to how much the people who worked on the building cared about it. Um, and it involves a, a window frame or window casing. Can you, can you tell us about that? Uh, yes, I sure can. And it's actually in this room right here, in this window that actually we're sitting across from. 
So during the process of the repairs and reconstruction, the house had been moved over about a thousand feet and set in its current location. But it was in pretty rough shape uh, for the move. They had stripped out the windows and doors and a lot of the um, finishes of the house to both to lighten it up and to make access for the movers to get into new shoring and this, that, and the other. And also this particular room that we're sitting in, the dining room, the corner of it had been knocked in by a front end loader when the house was across in its original location in an attempt to maybe demolish it beyond the point of saving to put an end to the whole idea of saving the house. So in any case, we came in and part of what we had to do is to rebuild the corner of the room. And in that process, carpenters were working on the window and the casings and the trim, and they took a piece off in order to uh, check the uh, reinforcement of the window. And when they flipped it over, this piece of wood that was about maybe three feet long and four or five, six inches wide, they looked on the back of it and they noticed some pen in pencil, some writing. And, and when they re read it, it was very legible, and it was done in cursive, which there are still a few people today, older people, that can read cursive. It said, uh, built by J.N. Chestnut, the, initial, the initials J.N. Chestnut, in February of 1933. And this was obviously signed probably by a carpenter person who was working on this piece of trim and signed it just before they flipped it over and nailed it in place. And it had been there for those 70-some, 80 years until we just by chance happened to pull it off. But it symbolized a type of craftsmanship and a type of pride in the work that these craftsmen were doing at the time when this house was built. And we don't know who J.N. Chestnut was. It, it could be prob probably a, a man, but could have been a woman. And, um, but it was, uh, it was exciting and it, and it was inspirational to those of us working. And from that point forward, we had quite a few of the workers on, on the house that would sign on the back of pieces of wood that would be hidden underneath in the attic or uh, down in the basement. They would sign their names on boards and pencil with this thought that they too, maybe 100 years in the future, their names may be read by, by someone as it, with excitement that, wow, this, something good happened in this house. That's great. Uh, looking back prior to the year 2000, um, Casa Feliz was a private home for 70 years, yet it was significant to the community. Can anybody want to talk about you know, why Casa Feliz felt important to the community or what it meant to people in the community? Well, um, because as Jack mentioned, it was built during the Depression. Uh, it held out a lot of hope for people in the community who uh, were feeling the um, awful effects of the Depression. And here came a man who was willing to build a 6,000 square foot home. He employed a lot of people, and he just made an investment in the future. And um, I remember Peggy Strong, uh, the wife of the former mayor of Winter Park, said she was just a young girl at that time when that house was uh, being built. And people would walk by. Jack's father was uh, out with his drawing board on the site. They would look over his shoulder and watch the progress. of, uh, And it just meant a lot to a lot of people. So I think that is probably one of the reasons it was significant, too. And a lot of cool things happened in the house, even though it was a private home, right? Do you all want to touch on a couple of those? I mean, there, well, there were, uh, I'm thinking Sinclair Lewis, uh, but there were poets, there were presidents, uh, there were, the, the barbers did a lot of entertaining. I think that's one reason why the entrance hall in the house is as large as it is that my father knew that um, they would be doing quite a bit of entertaining. But it was certainly, um, it has been called a parlor of Winter Park because so many different people were, were entertained there. Um, one, one of the things that, um, if I can recall what it was, Peggy, while you were talking, um, 
and it's escaped me now, but I'll come back That's to it. That's fine. That's yeah. fine. Frank, what... It, yeah, yeah, I'm sure you'll think of it. Frank, what... Um, what you grew up in this community. What, what do you think Casa Feliz kind of meant to the community? Well, when I was, when I was a boy in elementary school, my family at the time lived in Maitland. I was considered one of the Maitland boys. But <laughs> I did attend Winter Park schools. I went to the uh, Catholic school right next door here, elementary school, and then to the high school down by Rollins College. But I rode the school bus to school back in those days. And that journey involved coming uh, up uh, down uh, Temple Drive to Palmer and then turning, and the bus would ramble around the lake. And... Uh, I can remember being in the bus on a daily basis and we'd look over to Lakeside and there's these series of these graceful homes that sat back on spreading lawns. And occasionally the bus would slow down and we'd look up there and we'd see an elderly gentleman with a mule-drawn cart walking, uh, being, uh, riding down the Palmer Avenue and he would have um, Oh, palm fronds and, and landscape. He would draw this, uh, this, this mule would draw his cart and he would pick up trash and this sorts of thing, provide services. And later the, the mule lived over here on what we call the west side now. But as we would go around the lake, um, one of the houses that would always uh, grab my attention was Casa Feliz. And it was this brick. We think of it now as an Andalusian farmhouse sitting way back on its lawn with a beautiful tile roof. And there was a bit of mystery about it. But it represented to me this, this, this very um, a sense of established community where we had Rollins College on the south end of the downtown district, this chain of lakes that meandered under roads, a golf course, and then we had homes like Casa Feliz and others that we've lost, unfortunately, since then around the lake. And, and as a boy growing up, I associated so much of that with the, with the, the, the quality of the community and the a sense of history and permanence of this community and the way it, um, it, w it was just something that um, was an, I associate with a, with a happy time of my life. That's wonderful. I love that. I'm, I'm going to stay with you for a second. So what... Oh, yeah, go ahead. I just recall Peggy mentioned the Depression, and one of the interesting stories that my father told me was everything was ready. Uh, they had had kind of a little bit of a groundbreaking. He had sculpted a model of Casa Feliz out of clay. They met on the lakefront on Lake Osceola. So everything was good to go. And they were going to start on a Monday morning, and the previous week, the banks closed. So my father was kind of very nervous, and I'd say probably heartbroken is a better word, because he figured there was no way. And so he called Mr. Barber, and Mr. Barber said, Gamble, don't worry. He said, I took all of the money out of the bank last week. We're good to go. We'll start Monday morning bright and early. So that was kind of how the Depression touched the beginning of the project. I love that. I love that. Well, let's flash forward to the year 2000. Um, and Frank, what was the first that you heard that Casa Feliz might be in trouble or yeah. was in trouble? Yes. So I, I heard it. I don't remember reading it uh, in the paper or some sort of a official acknowledgment somewhere. But it was some hearsay from a friend that um, I knew the house that had let, been last lived in by the Holler family had been sold to the Heller family. And um, the rumor was that it was going to be torn down to make room for a larger house and that a demolition permit had actually been issued. And that was the first that I heard of, of, of that. And I really found it hard to believe because it was just hard to imagine that this house couldn't be adequate for anyone. And, and then with the historic uh, importance of the house. But that was, uh, at that point, a number of the ladies of the community, I think, had rallied forward Peggy Strong and a and Peggy, you were, I think, involved at that time also. 
And this is where I was first becoming aware of it. I was just kind of an uh, unbelieving member of the community that time, trying to get a little bit of information. Mm -hmm. what, what do you remember from that time, Mother? Well, I do remember that Peggy Strong was one of the women who uh, was parading outside holding signs, and our two little granddaughters, Abby and Hope Rogers, were holding signs saying, Honk for Preservation. <laughs> we, were, we were out of town when we received the news and uh, got on an airplane and started making a list of people we could call and things we could do to halt the process. And so do you remember what happened next? There was something at City Hall, right? We, we, we came in, I believe we came in on a Sunday when we returned to town. I think the City Commission meeting was Monday. It was just a day or two after we arrived. And I just remember sitting in the room and, and listening to the passion of the people that got up and said, absolutely do not destroy this home. And there were people ranging all the way from architecture students at the University of Florida to Peggy Strong, of course, who was the wife of a, a past mayor and, uh, and others. And where it went from there, um, I wrote down the names of the people that were speaking that were really passionate about saving the home. And, and within the next couple of days, just called these people and said, would you be willing to serve uh, in a core group of people to try to save Casa Feliz? And uh, I don't remember anyone turning me down, but that, that was how the inaugural board of Casa Feliz came together. And, uh, and so the city did issue, uh, did rescind the, the demolition permit, at least temporarily, until a plan could be made of how, how to save the house. But it wasn't unison. I mean, not everybody thought that the house should be saved, right? Right. <laughs> there was a lot of rancor in the community, I can tell you. We had people who stood up and said, uh, Peggy and Jack, bricks and mortar are more important to you than the lives of people. And we, we wondered what that was about, and they were concerned that golf balls would be hitting people who were coming in to see the house. And, uh, and then we had, we had, we had uh, people who, uh, who said, we are going to be taking away green space. Please don't do that. We need as much green space as we can get. So, uh, and then one gentleman said, I don't care if it's moved or it's not moved. I'm tired of talking about it at cocktail parties. <laughs> well, you, know, you can't argue with that. That is sound reasoning. Um, but ultimately a plan was forged, an agreement, right, with the city and the owner of the house to move the house uh, or to at least stay the execution and, and move, and move well, the house. Well, that, that's true, and it, that really happened between September and probably November, December. Mm -hmm. But I think one of the most entertaining things that happened uh, involved the bald eagles, and, and uh, the, the house had a huge pine tree in the front yard, and, and there was an eagle's nest in that tree. Now, the person that was going to move the house was George Saunders, and for some reason, George Saunders and the owner were the only ones that talked to each other about solving the problem. Uh, Owners didn't want to talk to any of the rest of us, but they would talk to George. So George was over there uh, in November, and he was talking to the owner out in the front yard standing under the pine tree. And uh, the owner said, you know, it's my understanding that the eagles go away for a period of time, and then they return, and they rebuild the nest, and eggs are laid, and it goes from there. But uh, he said, you know, the eagles haven't come back. And George told this story, and he said it was almost as the words were out of his mouth. Looked up, and, and the eagle was there. It was in the sky, and you know how they drop. You know, they set their wings, and they drop, and the talons are out. And this eagle hit a limb on an adjacent tree and broke it off, and then he flew up and started rebuilding the nest. And so it, it was... That was the, the only reason we were really able to save the house at that point because 
it, there was going to be a lot of time that was involved in doing that, and the owners really didn't want to wait. So the so Mother Nature kind of issued a stay of execution. Uh, for Mother, the... Mother Nature stepped up. Uh-huh, uh-huh. <laughs> um, so you all set about set out to raise the money to, to move the house. About how much did you think that was going to cost? You recall, Frank, the numbers that. Well, we always thought it was going to cost about two hundred and fifty thousand mm-hmm. dollars. And we would somehow or another manage to get about that much money, and then we would work, 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 and we were nowhere near finished, and we had used up all the money. <laughs> so we would sit down and think about what's it going to cost us to complete this, and we would come up with about another two hundred and fifty thousand dollars, and then we would work, 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 and. We still weren't done, and we'd meet together and say, well, how much is it going to cost us to finish this? And we'd come up with another 200 and some thousand dollars. What, what were some of the ways, um, Pegster, do you recall, that, um, that the Friends of Casa Feliz raised money to move the house? We did. We, uh, Don Sondag came forward and did a wonderful painting of the house, and we made a poster out of that, and we sold posters. Uh, we had commemorative bricks uh, that we sold, um, we had uh, T-shirts and hats. We <laughs> we stood at the farmers market and peddled as much as we could to raise money, but the community was very dear. They rallied round at the end and and uh, really supported. When they when they finally saw that it was going to happen, I think they became engaged. Um, one of the things that helped us a lot um, there were. 70 newspaper articles in the Sentinel regarding Casa Feliz and, you know, the headlines were, you know, the wrecking ball is stopped, you know, and stuff like that. And I think that helped us a great deal. And then we did have a couple of events at Casa Feliz. We knew who our potential large donors were. And as I recall, there were two parties, so uh, I think were both in February, maybe, um, 2001 and 2002, but we had, I think, more than 100 people at those gatherings, and so we raised a lot of money that way. And then we also had a a grant from the state of Florida, which was we were ranked number one in the state in 2002 as a preservation project, and that was a $251,000 grant, so that helped a great deal. Well, finally, the day came in September, significantly, you know, just a week or two weeks before 9-11, when enough money had been raised to move the house. Um, Daddy, can you talk about some of the technical aspects of what were involved in in moving and relocating the house? Well, there were a a number of things. One was that the house had been damaged, uh, with corners of the house, as Frank mentioned, had been damaged. And in order to to secure the the real um, integrity of the structural system, that needed to be repaired first. And while that was going on, we had a full basement under the house. If we hadn't had a full basement, I don't know really how it could have been moved. We wanted to move it in one piece, which sounds like a big order for something that weighs 750 tons. But George Saunders was the mover, and he found a couple of beams that were, I remember, about 40 inches deep and about 100 feet long. And they were run through the basement down the length of the house. And then about 16-inch I-beams were run at 90 degrees to that. Engineers had determined lifting points on the structure. So they, they had to get those long beams and the cross beams underneath. They had to disconnect the house from its foundations. And then they hydraulically had to jack the house up until they got it free. Now the next part of the puzzle was how were they going to move it and they, George brought in 20 dollies, they were new, had pneumatic plungers in them, there were eight uh, pneumatic tires, that, uh, tri- like truck tires really, on each dolly and uh, they hooked those up to, believe it or not, a laptop computer 
they plugged all the lifting values in that the engineers had come up with, and when they hit a key on the computer, it picked the building up off the foundations. So then it was on the dollies, and in so many words, it was ready to roll. Now, it wasn't completely ready to roll because the basement level, of course, was lower than the front yard, so there was a lot of excavation that had to take place in front of the house. And uh, at that point, um, they were able to hook up a, 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 a winch, which I think, Frank, if I remember, 50-ton capacity, and they had to move it along very slowly. And that's another story that somebody else can probably share, but uh, that was quite a spectacle. Mm. Uh, uh, what do you remember, how do you remember the community reacting during the move, the day that it was moved? Oh, it was so magical. It was a beautiful day. They, of course, had to close Interlock and Avenue to begin the parade across the street, and it was kind of like watching paint dry because <laughs> it was very, very slow. But George Saunders had set up bleachers over on the site, and uh, people arrived with donuts and coffee and coolers full of water, and um, uh, we had uh, the Dixieland band from... Disney come, and they rode around in, what was the car? It was, it was a 1929 Packard touring car that Thad Seymour Seymour, had. Thad Seymour drove. We had bunting, red, white, and blue bunting draped over the balconies, and it just was a, a lot of fun. Yeah, I remember uh, one of the TV stations did a split screen where there was a turtle on one side and Casafelis on the other because it was pretty slow moving, but it made it. It made it, and really, then the journey was just beginning. Um, I, I remember uh, uh, during it was that day too, and I was just an excited uh, spectator like everyone else. But I can remember being on the golf course and looking as it was coming. And here was our super talented local artist, Don Sondag, who had set up his chair and his easel, and he was painting a picture of Casa Feliz as the movers were slowly coming in his direction. And he was able to get the details, <laughs> had plenty of time to do it. That's great. That's great. You know, Betsy, I think a lot of people probably thought that thing is just going to crumble. They're going to get it up on those, on those dollies, and the first thing you know, it's just going to cave in. But I think I'm correct. We moved the house and didn't sustain one crack. We, we absolutely did not. That Even in the plaster in the house, we didn't have any cracks. It, it was amazing, and it was moved in one piece. Mm -hmm. And I think if we had had to break it up into smaller pieces, it would have been questionable as to whether we could have done it. Mm -hmm. Well, I know once the house was moved, then there was the second issue of how to restore the house because the plan was to restore it to the original um, architect's drawing. So um, why don't you tell about the day that you met Frank? Well, that was quite an event, uh, really. The, <laughs> the, the house was in its present location, but it was up on crossed railroad ties because uh, George Saunders had to send those dollies. He had rented those, I think, some from someone up around the Great Lakes. Cost him a lot of money every day. So they, they had to get the house settled on the railroad ties. We put up about a seven-foot cyclone fence around the property to keep someone from coming on the site and getting injured. But I came by the house late one afternoon and I went out the, the back door under the arch and I noticed that outside of the cyclone fence to my left there was someone standing there looking through with their fingers kind of through the fence wire. And I thought, you know, I've, I've got something that I need to do. And I turned and started walking toward my car. And then all at once I thought, you know what? I really need to go talk to that guy, you know. So I walked back, and it was Frank. And so we had a conversation about it, and he seemed, you know, knowledgeable about construction and all those things. But it was just a conversation. And we parted, and I went one way, and Frank went the other. But the next day the phone rang. It's Frank. And he said, you know, Jack, I've been thinking about this. And he said, I'm a general contractor. And 
he said, I would like to volunteer, you know, my services to oversee the restoration of the house. So that was a huge gift. Frank, have you had a psychiatric diagnosis? <laughs> yeah, let's see. How, I'm thinking that's how I remember it. <laughs> Pretty Did you know what you were doing? See, what Jack into? doesn't know is I was part of the Sheriff's Work Release Program, <laughs> and I had to show that I was going to have some kind of a job for the next six months so I wouldn't have any. So I was standing outside the fence, actually gawking at the house, admiring the house, as I had done a number of times in the later part of the afternoon and the house was here alone it was kind of the hoopla had died down the crowds were gone and the house was kind of sitting here nestled but a little forlorn but I I loved visiting it and then the door opened and this gentleman walks out and looks over to me and turns to walk the opposite direction stops and comes back to me and he walks right up to me puts out his hand he says hi I'm Jack Rogers and I just saw you here, and I just had to come over and introduce myself. And so we chatted a little bit, and what I remember is Jack said, we're, we're going to have some folks here this, this weekend. We're going to open up the house, a few people, just to let them see it. And if you would like to, why don't you stop by? You're invited to see the house. Come in and see it, too. And this was in March of 2002. So this was uh, four or five months after the house had actually been moved uh, to its current location, but nothing had really been done to it. So I did show, show up at that little open house. I have a few photographs of that time and, and got to meet Peggy at that time and a few other people and walk through. And I had been in the house about uh, 20 years before when the Dickinson family had owned it briefly for a little social event, but never really walked through all of it. And it was such a delight and a pleasure to see it. And kind of, I was just awestruck with it. And that led to a, a further discussion with Jack about well, what happens next. And I was uh, so delighted when he was willing to include me as part of the team move, moving forward. Later I learned, of course, that I was the only offer he had. <laughs> so the bar was not very high. <laughs> you know, as, as we went along, uh, we, we went six months and Frank was still working on this thing and I'm thinking to myself, you know, this is, this is getting to be a big deal and, and a lot of hours and a lot of uh, contribution in that part. So. Uh, I called Frank and said, let's go have lunch, you know, and so we went out and had lunch, and I said, Frank, you know, this doesn't seem quite fair, you know, you're donating your time to do this, and it's, uh, it's been six months, and Frank looked at me, and he said, just leave me alone, I'm having too much fun. <laughs> no other uh, customer or person I was working with had ever offered to buy me lunch, so that was... <laughs> It was kind of a big deal. Your meal ticket. <laughs> um, you know, there were so many. I mean, the restoration of the house took two years, um, a little more than two years. Um, other than financial, what were a couple of the primary challenges or the biggest jobs in restoring this house? Frank, you know, what comes to my mind is finding the materials. I mean, Frank was plugged in, and you can tell us a little about that, but the, the materials, uh, quality of materials that are in the house almost didn't exist, and that's what we had to find. Well, early on, Jack, you had made it clear that the restoration of the house and what we were going to do was going to be of, of the highest standard, equal to the quality of the construction that was original to the house. We weren't going to just run down and get whatever happened to be available at Home Depot <laughs> for the day to, 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 to plug in. And so there, because if you look around the house, you see these hand-hewn beams and timbers and this, that, and the other. And so uh, finding some of those, we weren't sure. We had to rebuild what was originally the garage of the house that had been torn down before the house was moved. And we were fortunate enough to have a very, very talented young mason who was dedicated himself a couple of years of his life to come over here and do all of the masonry work at the very highest level of craftsmanship. 
But we had to come up with some big timbers and some, some wood, and we didn't necessarily want it to be new. And so we, uh, one way or another, were linked into a feller uh, up from the Palatka, just outside of the Palatka area, area and a brother, Mark Webb, who, who built custom furniture from native hardwood and preached a little gospel on Wednesday nights <laughs> up there. And <laughs> somehow we invited him to come down here to see what we were doing because we had some, some beams that we had to hewn. And we knew the story that Jack, your, your father, had had a, a craftsman that could hewn these beams by hand with an adze, and we wanted to be able to, to do that. And so Brother Mark Webb showed up one day, and he was in his, his overalls, and he had a big old hat on, and he came on up, and he looked around. He was chewing tobacco, big old handlebar mustache, and looked around. He said, yep, I think I can do this sort of thing. And so he was a, a, a craftsman we were able to talk tap into. And we had another local fellow who unfortunately we've lost since, um, uh, Ron Black, who among other things was interested in um, wood, recycled wood from around the southern United States for various things he did. And he stopped by one day by happenstance and started chatting and we were showing him what we were trying to do. And he said, well, I might have a resource for you. And so he, he drove up to some uh, tobacco warehouses that were being taken apart in Albany, uh, Georgia, yeah. and loaded up some old timbers and joists on his own flatbed trailer and drove them back down here and drove in one day and he said, would these work for you for, for your, what we now call the garden room, which was the original garage, and they happened to be perfect and they were from the same era that the house was built and we were able to use those. And so there was a lot of uh, fortunate happenstance, circumstance, and connections that uh, providential that we were able to come into to acquire materials just when we happened to need them and we weren't sure when and where we would get them. So, so. Yeah, Frank, I remember when that trailer came in and the, the beams were in the neighborhood of 20 or 22 feet long, and they were two by six, two by eight, somewhere, probably two by eight. But I remember watching one of the workmen take one of those beams and put it on his shoulder. And he started walking, and he, he strided out, and then he started slowing down. And the beam started, you know, flexing on both ends, and the next thing I knew, he was on his knees. The weight of that one beam took him, and he was a big man, but uh, those beams were dense southern yellow pine, and they were very, very heavy. Um, uh, Pegster, I know um, while they were tending to the construction, you were thinking about kind of furnishing the home and what we were going to put in the house so that it was truly a home. How did you kind of approach that? Process. Well, we were very fortunate in that we had a lot of photographs of the interior of the home. Harold Costain had done beautiful uh, photographs uh, pr prior to uh, us it, being involved. It was for a magazine, right? I what believe that's first? right. It was for a magazine. So we did have a guideline. Now, Mr. Barber hired an interior decorator and sent her to Spain and gave her an unlimited budget. She was allowed to bring back authentic Spanish antiques. I was sent to Tuesday morning <laughs> to try to come up with something to warm up the house. But actually, we were very fortunate at that time. Uh, that was 20 years ago. And the decor then was rather old world European. So when we had to reupholster furniture and uh, find some certain items for the house, we were fortunate in that regard. There were brocades and velvets and so forth so that we could use that. But your father and I went on hunting dis uh, expeditions. <laughs> Wasn't the kind of hunting I was right. wanting to do. We were in Atlanta. We went to antique stores here and we would find pieces of furniture and we would uh, find all these pieces that looked just wonderful. And then I would call my 
little friend Lucy Standridge who was an interior designer and she would come over and she said that's great put it there that's fine hang it here so she was a wonderful help to us that's great sounds like fun it was um, so finally the day came for the house to um, be opened it was uh, early 2005 when it was officially open to the public um, uh, what do you all remember of that day, and do you feel like um, it's been successful? Um, I'd, I'd like to start off on that one. Uh, what I remember, which was absolutely a remarkable experience, uh, someone came up and, and got me. Uh, I was somewhere off, maybe in the courtyard, and they said, there is someone here who actually worked on the house, physically worked on the house with his hands, you know, when it was built in 1933. Well, I had never really talked to anyone that had worked with my father um, on something, on anything, frankly, because, I, you know, I was born four or five years later. But at any rate, I went out to the to the entrance hall, and there was an old fellow there that was in his late 80s, the early 90s. And the story that he told me, I asked him, I said, what was it like working with my father, you know, on, on this house? And he said, well, he said, I was in high school, and he said... Uh, they wouldn't let me do anything but the straight work. He said, I, I was uh, the son of, the, of the, the head mason on the project, but he said, uh, I could only do the straight work. I just didn't have enough experience, you know, to do anything special. But he said, what I remember about your father is that he spent a lot of time on the site. You know, after it was dried in, he had a drawing board and he made sketches and he talked to those of us that were working on the house. But he said every day of around four o'clock when we when we knocked off, he said your dad would go around and he would talk to everybody that was working on the on the job. And now this was after seventy years, remember this since this had happened. And he looked at me and he said, What I remember about your father is that he never spoke to me like I was a kid. And uh, you know, that may be the most precious memory I have of the opening of the house because it was you you, you can be a son or be a member of her family but you many times you don't hear those kind of stories that you know speak to the kind of person that uh, is involved we have a we have a photograph Jack a couple of photographs of you talking to that gentleman on that day mm -hmm. I, that I, I noticed from the archive last night. So you have to get those. So that that was quite a amazing event, and I I recall the event as another uh, very exciting, uh, a little bit like the day that the house was moved, where people were there and balloons were there and the band was there. We had a similar sort of thing. That. <clears throat> Dad Seymour had his balloon machine set up when he was blowing helium balloons. And we had music playing and people were coming in and there was a lot of excitement. And I remember thinking how the house just looked so beautiful. There had been all this work going on for a couple years-ish, several years, and it had been finished and it was painted and there was, uh, there was furniture and furnishing some things in here. And it looked so good, and people were so excited to walk around and gawk at this room and look at that room and ooh and ah and this sort of thing. So it, it, it was a, a, a wonderful time in, in, in my memory. What are some of the um, things that have happened in the building over the years as kind of Winter Park's reborn community parlor? Uh, what are your uh, what are your thoughts about how it's used now? Well, of course, for a lot of weddings, as you can imagine. But uh, it was kind of interesting when we had a board meeting and we were talking about what are we going to do <laughs> with this house. Uh, it was kind of a field of dreams attitude. If we move it, will they come? Uh -huh. 
And one of the board members said, well, we could have weddings here, but think how small they'd have to be, and we maybe we'll have one a month. Well, it turns out that we have about 100 a year now. And uh, as you pointed out, Betsy, it, it isn't a house that really uh, says, come have a wedding here. The uh, kitchen is not a catering kitchen. The rooms are small. Uh, you have to limit the size of the wedding. You can't have too much noise, and uh, the music can't go on until all hours of the morning. So it's very restricted. <clears throat> But again, we have, we have to turn weddings away, and it's the romance of the house that provides a, a wonderful backdrop for a special event. What about, um, can you talk about the house as um, kind of a beacon to historic preservation and other, um, other community events that have taken place here, sponsored by the, by the Friends of Casa Feliz? Well, uh, t to me, this has got to be one of our, our most notable and successful examples of historic preservation in, in Winter Park. I think it, at least to my mind, galvanized this notion that people would even think about historic preservation. There, there were some events prior to Casa Feliz uh, over the decades or whatever that would speak to the need for historic preservation. But I think so when, when this happened and then the community rallied forth and brought it into the kind of the public domain of awareness and then the house was successfully moved as a kind of a with private funds but with the city providing the, the land that it was on and then the house has, has so seamlessly and easily moved into the kind of day-to-day -day life of the civic experience for the city of Winter Park, providing a venue for many types of gatherings. And we've had two to 300,000 people come through the house and be involved in the house in the years since it was moved, many of those experiencing some of their happiest family memories in creating those. And the, it's so pleasing to me to think of it's not just a locked up a venue for going and looking at old furniture on certain days of the week. This is an active, vital part of the the living, breathing fabric of the community, mm -hmm. and it's 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 really exciting to see that. And to some, I know we've had others uh, homes that have been saved, historically the Capen House being one that has kind of been able to follow a little bit in the model of, of Casa Feliz, and. Uh, it took a lot of work and courage for the folks involved in that to, to, to see, see that happen. But I, I, I'm hoping that this will, Casa Feliz remains as a beacon, a success story to kind of encourage and embolden uh, others and not only this community but other communities that these things are possible and worthwhile in the long run. You know, it's <clears throat> to me the it's a piece, uh, Frank, Frank used the word fabric, and uh, the, the buildings are, are pieces of something that um, strengthen the streets in the community, the streets in the community uh, strengthen the neighborhoods, and the whole thing becomes a kind of a collage, and they, they feed on each other, they reinforce each other, and that is why you hear people say um, it's, it's a village and, and they talk about village scale and they talk about the way they feel, you know, when they're in the city of Winter Park. Uh, National Geographic Traveler, I think it was their fifth annual listing of historic destinations worldwide and they listed 109 places, and Winter Park ranked number 38. So we do have something here that is unique and it's meaningful. Uh, I was seated at a dinner that was sponsored by Rollins College, and Andre Stwarney was there, and Andre Stwarney as an architect was on the faculty at the University of Miami Architectural School. 
he was receiving an award, and fortunately, I was seated next to him at the at the event. And we talked about Kosovo East, and we talked about my father's architecture, and he mentioned Grenada Court, you know, which we think of as Barney's Courtyard, which was one of my father's projects in 1948. But what he said was. I sent a group of students up from the University of Miami to measure that courtyard and, and to photograph it and sketch and do all of those things because I wanted them to better understand why they felt the way they did when they walked into that courtyard. And that's what the historic preservation is really all about. And, uh, this house has that in spades, and, and it's from the outside, from the inside, uh, the spaces, the details, the way it, it, it goes together. Um, again, is just a crucial fabric uh, of, of uh, historic preservation in this community. Well, I think that's a good place to, to end. So I want to thank our panelists for participating this morning, <laughs> Frank, Mother, Daddy. And um, thanks for tuning in. Um, you know, the Friends of Casa Feliz continue to do wonderful work and sponsor programs for the community. So I would um, urge our uh, listeners, uh, all 14 of you, to, um, <laughs> to check out Casa Feliz's website and um, to come, if you haven't seen the house, to come to one of the open houses and, and tour and see for yourself. And I want to thank the History Museum for, for um, providing this opportunity to talk about this, this seminal event in, in Winter Park's history. So thanks again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.